My name is uh, Dan Kahn. I'm the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I'm uh, thrilled to welcome our uh, first ever public cloud panel where we have uh, representatives from uh, almost all the biggest uh, public clouds uh, around the world. And um, I'll start out by uh, just asking each of them to uh, introduce themselves, also uh, how you uh, joined your company, where you're from, uh, how far you came to, co to get here, that kind of thing. Uh, sure, I, I'm, I'm Gabe Roy. I'm the lead program manager for containers in Microsoft Azure. I uh, came to Microsoft about seven months ago by way of acquisition. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm always in airplanes, so you know it wasn't much of a, much of a trip. <laughs> My name is Hong Tan. I'm the chief architect of Alibaba Cloud. I've been with Alibaba Cloud uh, for more than seven years, so witnessing the growth from a couple of hundred developers to now more than several thousand. Thanks. I'm uh, John. Is that going? Okay. Yep. I'm John Middlehauser. I uh, run the Container Native Development Group at Oracle. Um, I've been there about six months. There you go. Uh, Todd Moore, a uh, longtime IBMer, uh, local. So I <laughs> thank you all for coming uh, to Austin. I really enjoy it when we do these events here and uh, appreciate it. I, I handle open source for IBM. And uh, in particular, uh, I work with the CNCF as the governing board chair. And I'm also the chairman of the board for the Node.js Foundation. Hi, I'm Aparna Sinha. Uh, I'm with Google Cloud. Um, I lead product management for Kubernetes, the open source project, as well as for Google Container Engine, which is our hosted offering. Um, and I've been with Google for a little over four years, and I've spent uh, most of my life in enterprise IT. I'm originally from Silicon Valley, so or that's where I'm traveling from. <laughs> so this is... Um a little bit of our recreation of our CNCF governing board meeting that we had uh, yesterday where uh, your five of the platinum members who support uh, CNCF and all of our projects at the highest level, and I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I guess I would just start, um, maybe we could start with Kubernetes, but then since this is also the Cloud Native Con Day, um, I'd love to go on and, and talk about some of the other 13 projects. I'm curious which ones um, you're using today in, uh, in production in the clouds, and then which ones either current CNCF projects or prospective CNCF projects you're, you're particularly excited about. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I'll just go down. Maybe we could start with the Perna. Sure. Um, so obviously, I'm very involved in Kubernetes. That takes up all of my time. Um, <laughs> and I love Kubernetes and the community. Um, but in terms of other projects, uh, Istio is a huge effort for us at Google, and I participate in that. Um, and we're very, very excited about it. I think actually a, a decent number of talks here are about Istio, and it'll be part of my talk as well. Um, also, the Open Service Broker, um, which is a collaboration with Cloud Foundry, that's um, an important one. And then Grafeas, um, which was uh, something that we open sourced recently. Um, Google has kind of a great open source uh, history, and so there are many that we are involved, involved with, but those are two that I'm particularly excited about. Yeah, obviously Kubernetes is really important to all of us. We wouldn't be here with it without it. Um, but you know, Container D, um, very very important. To the things that we're doing, uh, Istio as well too. Working closely with with Google on Istio, and you'll see all the tracks and all the talks that are happening here. Having that you know mesh layer that we can depend on um, really is is super important to all of us. I think as we build really complex applications and want to manage that policy disconnected from uh, you know, the application level, not having to modify applications to, to change policy. So really super important to us. As everybody said, sort of Kubernetes is the heart. So in terms of released products that we're you know, working with customers on, um, our core product is, is an offered Kubernetes service. Um, underneath, we obviously use Prometheus. Um, and offer ways for customers to do that as well. Uh, looking forward, we also are looking at microservices and service mesh, Istio being one. Um, we're active in the serverless working group. We announced our, our FN um, serverless cross-cloud product. Um, and then just today, we announced um, and open sourced a multi-cluster management platform um, that's built on top of uh, Kubernetes Federation called Navarcos. It's Greek for Admiral. 
following the same theme. So, um, you know, we, we just basically publish that and we're going to talk with a bunch of the folks here in terms of where it should fit in into the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, at Alibaba Cloud, our work with uh, uh, mainly work, uh, our, our work mainly involves the Kubernetes, the integration of Kubernetes as a managed service on our cloud, um, and also enabling uh, people to use Kubernetes to run uh, machine learning, HPC kind of workloads. Uh, we are also looking into uh, uh, integrating with uh, Container D, and also we are also looking into some other CNCF projects and seeing how that can help us. Uh, inside Alibaba Group, uh, obviously, um, we also use Kubernetes in various departments, particularly in the AI and the training kind of workload. Yeah, and at Microsoft, you know, we're very focused on delivering you know, what I like to refer to as sort of the CNCF stack of stuff, right, and making that available to customers. Things like our uh, you know, Kubernetes service, uh, which we just launched in preview uh, a little while ago. Um, you know, also technology like the Open Service Broker. We actually just today announced the new Open Service Broker for Azure, which is a, sort of a ground-up rewrite um, you know, that uh, conforms to the new Open Service Broker spec, you know, sort of glue Kubernetes to other outside services. Um, but I think what's more interesting interesting is the degree to which the CNCF technologies have started to penetrate inside of Microsoft. We're starting to see a lot of teams just, you know, Microsoft's a big company, right? And so, you know, people are just popping up kind of everywhere who are using, you know, hey, I'm using gRPC or hey, I'm using open tracing. And I think that's really just a, a good, you know, barometer of how healthy the CNCF community is uh, that we're starting to see that kind of adoption inside of a company like Microsoft. Great. Okay, let's see if we can make things a tiny bit more controversial. Uh, let's talk container runtimes. So um, there was a very fair tweet from uh, Vincent Batts uh, pointing out that Michelle Nirali congratulated Containerd and Rocket on hitting 1.0, but um, Creo also uh, just hit 1.0 and as a Kubernetes incubator project is also a CNCF project. So um, is it the case that each of you are using Docker today, not Container D. And then can you make a prediction a year from now on uh, runtime's uh, adoption in your cloud between Container D, and actually I'll, I'll go ahead and since Ahmad referenced Kata containers, um, so I'll say uh, Docker, Container D, Rocket, Creo, Kata, or something else. And uh, maybe we could start with Hong. Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, currently, we mainly using Docker as the uh, underlying runtime. Uh, I we don't pick battles. Uh, to me, I <laughs> think that uh, uh, the uh, container runtime, even the orchestration, would eventually be standardized, and uh, and we think that uh, uh, going forward, likely we are gonna go with the container. The but we are open, really open to whatever is available there, and uh, also we think what's really important. Uh, is from the uh, control plan side, it's the API consistency. From runtime side, I would say it's uh, performance, stability, and cross-platform uh, cross compatibility. So um, um, that's my answer. <laughs> John? It's basically the same answer, right? We're, we try and be agnostic. I mean, my group within Oracle is all built on open source, non-forked, technologies. I mean, same thing Gabe basically said, which is we're building the CNCF offering for our customers. Um, you know, but, but just to be clear, all three of the um, Containerd, Rocket, and Creo are all open source, OCI compliant. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, we've worked on the OCI, you know, we actually wrote a Rust implementation of OCI to, you know, demonstrate and to improve that format. So, you know, it's not something we have particular religion on and, and you know, or, you know, are gonna make a call on, it's not our place to do that. Yeah, I, I don't think it has to be a religious argument. And so Phil Estes from our team, you'll see a lovely talk on Containerd from mm -hmm. Phil and showing something, so I, you know, look up Phil's talk. Um, we're, we're gonna provide what people wanna have. And yeah. you know, our current, the IBM cloud is is Docker and Kubernetes. And uh, you know, it, it won't be a religious argument for us, it'll be what is being asked for by the, the folks at large, the end user base. Yeah, so I think one of the best things that we've done in the Kubernetes architecture is to develop the CRI, the Container Runtime Interface, and that has taken us more than a year, I think. Um, CRI, the Container Runtime Interface. The interface which allows you to plug in multiple different 
run times no. um, and switch them out depending on which one is better for your application. And uh, we started that process in May of last year, um, you know, uh, so that so that there could be many different runtimes. And I think after that, um, we've been using in Google Container Engine Docker because historically this is a now we're in our third year of the service, or it's been a while. Um, but we also have contributed to Containerd right from the beginning, um, and so Lantau on our team um, is an essential, essential part of that project. And we collaborate with the other runtimes. I'm very excited about Kata containers. Uh, I think actually it opens up a new range of um, applications. Mm -hmm. And so I don't expect the future to look like the past. Um, I don't necessarily think that it'll be one runtime. It may be different runtimes for different applications. But again, the product manager in me, it's going to depend on, as far as Google Container Engine, it's going to depend on what customers want. Anything to add, Gabe? Yeah, I mean, you want a controversial yeah, question? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> you know, I, I seriously, because yeah. the customers I talk to, they don't care what container right. runtime is there, right? They want to deliver code, they want to deliver applications. I mean, we use Docker today. You know, I, I think there's a lot of options going forward, but at the end of the day, this is a commodity component, right? In, in the stack, it shouldn't be doing too much. It should be boring infrastructure. We get to hear that term yeah. thrown around a lot. So for me, I value mileage. I value you know, how, how much production use does this have, how hardened is it, that sort of thing. Um, and if customers are aware of what container runtimes you know they're using um, beyond things like you know building models and things you know, uh, you know we talk, talk a little bit about serverless containers in a bit hopefully but um, uh, you know if if customers care what the runtime is we're doing something wrong but I, we, I, we failed if that happened yeah. so. and, and I, I really do just he's not here but just call out for a second um, the open container initiative which is a, a sister project of CNCF that's been led by Chris Anchek and the sea change here versus two years ago where we would get a panel up and they would argue constantly what the future is going to be. And yeah, back to the Tim Hawken quote that this is just a fantastic situation that is boring infrastructure. But those projects can go compete for mind share and market share and, and technical improvements, but it's no longer a, a, the same kind of political battle it was. What has mattered uh, as far as the runtime is stability um, you know, and responsiveness and inclusiveness as far as the community that, that is around that project. So, and maybe that matters more from an engineering perspective, but it does manifest itself into customers if there's, you know, if there's bugs and there's lots of patches and it's um, not evolving. Enterprise customers like stability. They want to see the thing that's well maintained, that's stable, that has a roadmap that they can buy into, and that they see a large developer base that's excited about working in it. There's a metaphor in the Linux world that um, the kernel developers run a Linux plumbers conference. And uh, like plumbing, it's kind of boring until it doesn't work, and then you get very, very upset. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one more try for controversy. Uh, Austin Collins of serverless.com uh, claimed to me last week that within two years, 75% of the applications deployed in public clouds would be serverless. Uh, so A, give me your own per percentage, and then B, to make it a tiny bit more realistic, um, maybe you could give some examples of uh, decomposing what it means to be serverless so that folks can get some of the functionality that they're excited about with Lambda in a, in a more generic infrastructure. Yeah, so you know, I think, I mean, just to answer the question, I don't know, 20%, something like that. You know, I, don't, I, don't actually think, right. I don't actually think event-based programming is a suited to every workload. So I think, you know, to me, you know, serverless is just a terrible term. It's just completed a bunch of things. I think we all can, can agree on that. Um, but it, the best definition I've heard is a, a, a three things. So it's one is, is uh, invisible infrastructure. You don't see the infrastructure. The second is microbilling. Right, people want microbilling, and the third is the event-based programming model, typically associated with functions as a service. Now, what we've done at Azure is we've actually said, well, that last one, that event-based programming model, that's a little restrictive. So why don't we focus on delivering something that's microbuild and invisible infrastructure, but use containers um, uh, as the form factor, because this gives a lot more flexibility. So we released back in July this thing called Azure Container Instances. We were the first major clouds to come out with what, what I call a serverless container runtime. Um, and I think this is a really interesting space. In fact, today, just at 11 o'clock, we just announced this new thing called the virtual kublet. 
And this is pretty fascinating because what the virtual kubelet does is it allows you to take Kubernetes and basically have a virtual node with unlimited capacity backed by one of these serverless container runtimes. So you get the benefits of serverless you know, in terms of microbilling and invisible infrastructure. You're not restricted by the event-based programming model and you get to use the Kubernetes API to drive it. So we're excited that this is now a, a, a sort of a, a community effort. We've teamed up with Hyper um, who uh, is delivering you know, one of the other serverless container runtimes. Uh, the repo is open source and available today. It's you know we're blogging about it and talking about it actively, so definitely recommend checking it out. Awesome. Yeah, I would, I'd also want to argue that uh, serverless is uh, probably a misleading word now. People started uh, using serverless as a substitution of function computer lambda, but uh, uh, I would argue you know the first serverless platform is really the. Uh, Google App Engine, right? It, it don't know it, 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 you don't know about the, anything about the servers. So, um, if you really take serverless literally, it really means cloud native. You know, you 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 really want to take advantage of uh, the elasticity uh, uh, on demand uh, billing of the uh, cloud services. And we can ask uh, yeah, so Joe Beta, you, who created Google App Engine, would you ever go on? <laughs> but to build but let me just rephrase the question. So, if you're really asking I about want a event, yeah. yeah, event based. Uh, 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 computing, I would say really depends on how you define this percentage, right? I would argue that most likely 75% 75, 75 application use more or less of those event triggering to glue those together. Maybe that's a realistic number, but in terms of the computing resources being consumed, I doubt that's gonna consume a lot of resources. I would still argue, you know, there would be um, uh, the diversity of computing paradigms, you know, you know, including still people deploying to the virtual machines, using containers, even using, you know, uh, 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 for the data analytical workload, which is the bulk of the computation being used. Uh, um, people want to use managed uh, big data services, right? So, so in terms of uh, total res uh, computing resources being used, I doubt it's gonna be a big percentage. Yeah, I think you guys see different customers than I do. Um, you know, one thing about my group is we're really targeted at, you know, not surprising the Oracle customers, right? So, you know, what we are looking at is the large enterprise customers who frankly are, you know, still running Java web logic local on-prem, right? So, you know, the, the transition those customers are looking for is, you know, what we call modern application development, and it's, you know, it's this stack we're talking about. It's CNCF-based Kubernetes transition, et cetera. Um, I mean, frankly, Docker containers is pretty new for a lot of those, right? So, it, you know, 75% of applications in the cloud being serverless is, I mean, it's, it's ridiculously high. If, depends on what you mean by in the cloud, of course, which I think you have to define first. Um, you know, if, if you're saying new applications being written by, you know, the guy at Stanford pulling out a credit card and getting an Azure account or an AWS account, I think a lot of those things will be architected, you know, parts of them in an event-based architecture like Gabe talked about. Um, but, you know, applications in general, I mean, to start with all the massive applications out there, I mean, we didn't, are we talking quantity of applications or quantity of users or, you know, my first instinct was 20%, but again, without defining the terms, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, one of the other things that Oracle thinks is important, um, or my group thinks is important, is that, that serverless, which I agree with the consensus is a horrible term, um, you know, shouldn't be, a vendor lock-in type thing. And, and the way it started, obviously, it became that, um, you know, the, the primary the primary implementation people think of is 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 Lambda, and, and that is really tied in deeply with, with AWS. So, you know, FN, one of the reasons we open sourced and announced it was a framework by which you, as an end developer, could create serverless function-based programming uh, that was cloud agnostic, just the way Kubernetes is. Um, and you should be able to move those applications between any Kubernetes cluster on-prem, on, you know, on any public cloud, on your laptop. Uh, and, and we think that's a significant benefit to the end developer, which is really kind of what my group is focusing on. So I'm the open source guy at IBM, and open is what I believe in. And uh, for 
this world, I believe, again, as John has, has talked about, that we should have uh, an open alternative that we can all get behind. To that end, we took our open WISC infrastructure and we brought it out to the Apache Software Foundation, uh, where we're actively working with the likes of Adobe and Red Hat and others to go and build up uh, essentially uh, uh, a ubiquitous, widely available um, open source project for, for serverless. It really comes back to the eventing though. In the end, we all have this multitude of, of serverless platforms that we'll have. Um, but what is important is to get to a, an eventing model and some specifications and things that allow for you know, the events to happen, triggers to happen, policies to be followed and work to be done, and that people will use that technology as appropriate to orchestrate and run the applications that they're, they're building and running. But it won't be the thing, the thing that everybody does. It'll be a big part of their portfolio of how they go about doing work. Um, so that's what we're trying to enable uh, and uh, with some success. And, and of course, uh, Lambda, you know, I get to plug Node.js now, right? So Absolutely. you know, Lambda and others and ourselves, uh, you know, uh, really came together around Node.js as the way of going and doing that. So um, you know, anybody who's looking at serverless also then needs to go look at, at Node.js as, as how they're gonna go put that together and, and use it. And I think there's a great synergy there. Um, small, tight, quick to start up, run, do things. And that's what we see. And you know, currently our world uh, with OpenWhisk is based on Docker, uh, but we're working uh, quite nicely with the Kubernetes team now to, to look at moving, uh, moving over on to Kubernetes. And I think the future is bright for serverless and there'll be many light bulbs. Um, excuse me, Perna. I th think I didn't get John and Todd to get pinned down on that percentage number uh, on their clouds in two years. Well, I gave I, you I, my answer, didn't you? <laughs> I mean, I, I said 20%, depending uh, on how you define right. a lot of terms. Right, right. No, but broad um, definition. I, I just yeah. in terms of what he said, though, it, I think it is worth pointing out in the context of CNCF that the working, the serverless working group is working on the open event exactly. specification. I believe yeah, we all co that. Yeah, yeah, I believe all of us are taking part of that. So. Okay, I'll give you a counter prediction. I think that 80% of public cloud will run containers in uh -huh. three to five years. Um, I hope that the majority of that will be running Kubernetes. I think the reason for that is because Kubernetes is open and it runs anywhere. And I think that you can apply that principle to serverless as well. Um, I think Hong mentioned that App Engine is the first serverless. Um, offering in the cloud, and that's true. The benefits of serverless are really when you don't get charged for when you're not running, and you can quickly scale to zero and quickly scale up. Uh, those benefits are difficult to realize on premise, and I think that's a limiting factor. A uh, lot of enterprise IT is on premise, and so if you have a paradigm which doesn't work in a hybrid environment, then that can limit its adoption. The other piece is that much of serverless today isn't open. And I think this is where you know, OpenWhisk and Kubeless and some of the other um, uh, fission and the frameworks that are coming up in the Kubernetes community are going to fill that gap of being open. I think if serverless can be open and have an analog on premise, then it has a higher probability of adoption in public cloud. Um, I think 75% is, is aggressive because of that. <laughs> yeah, and it, yeah, well, one of the things I'd point out is that the openness is not just, uh, you know, so that we can all feel good that we're using open source. You know, part of the reason here is that functions are gonna live in an ecosystem that's heterogeneous. Functions are gonna be talking to containers, talking to VMs, talking to legacy stuff. And if it's, you know, ideally, if we can get it all running on Kubernetes, as a partner is, is suggesting, we can, you know, allow for, you know, coherent network policy, uh, you know, management and things like that to actually work across a and compute substrate. Uh, I think that's really important to realize in the vision of serverless going forward. The network side is the hard part on this. I think functions is very compelling um, for IoT, and we have to see kind of how that evolves as well. Um, App Engine is very compelling for a lot of different types of applications. We know that, so. But, but you know, serverless is a category of kind of moving away, you know, making infrastructure boring, right? So is microservices and Istio and service mesh and some of the things built on top of that. I mean, a lot of what we're worrying about is, you know, how you do abstract that away, and so they, you know, they don't care what 
cloud they're running on. They don't care what infrastructure. They, they care about you know, what is giving them the characteristics they need, whether that's data locality or security or performance or, or any of that. Um, they're writing applications. And then, you know, obviously, we as cloud providers compete on those other factors, but the end developer is specifying characteristics of their applications that they need. Um, so of all five of you offer a managed Kubernetes service in the cloud. Uh, with Todd, there's a sister service of IBM Cloud Private. Cloud Private, yes. Um, oh, no, I was saying um, on, uh, on, the um, in, on bare metal. And so I guess, although um, from the cloud service, you might prefer enterprises to just move everything up, could you talk um, for a second about your hybrid cloud strategy when an enterprise says, I'm only willing to move some of my workloads into the cloud? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's more than that. Enterprises are also not willing to go and, and re-engineer legacy applications. And that thing yeah. that lives in the corner that is ancient that IBM probably helped you go and build and, and define a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. But with the technologies that we have, we're able to front end those and turn them into useful services now that they can depend on. And, and you have to have that available to the enterprise. They, it's just too difficult to go re-engineer everything cloud native. So our strategy is to enable the enterprise user base to continue supporting the things that they have to, do put the APIs in front of what they have to, but then also be able to have a, a, a way to develop in your own uh, private cloud with this exact same set of things that you can find in the public cloud and be able to migrate workload as you need to. So in this problem space of where you don't necessarily have that ability on premise to take advantage of what's there, you can take that workload and move it over into a public cloud environment using Kubernetes, using containers, and, and keep on going. Um, and, and this is something that we've really embraced ourselves in, internally as well, too. So even Watson, everybody hears about Watson, right? Watson is all, guess what? Running in containers on Kubernetes now. Watson, the services are turned over every 24 hours, mm -hmm. and they pick up the very latest updates out of all the open source code that's out there. And uh, the code clearance is continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, 2,000 packages are 95% automated and just clearing them as they go through. And it runs and keeps going. And every seven days, those servers just get restarted and continue, right? It's, it's a lovely way of doing things. Lovely. Uh, actually, I think we're the, the other way to Aperna, please. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I actually have a talk on hybrid on Friday at 11, so please come to that. Um, I think that... Uh, our open source initiatives, um, obviously Kubernetes, Istio, Open Service Broker, Grafeus, they're essential to enabling hybrid. Uh, the customers that I talk to who want hybrid, are they tend to be really large enterprises. They have large IT teams. They have very much a DIY kind of um, uh, uh, operation. And so the more we can give them to run open source software on their premise, um, in a way that is consistent with Google Cloud and with other clouds, the more uh, we enable hybrid. Uh, Gabe, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, uh, Microsoft has a lot of experience dealing with enterprises, right? Been around for you know, 20 plus years doing that. And one of the things we heard when we were planning out our cloud development strategy was things like Azure Stack um, and the ability to have a cloud in a box you know, that you can run um, on, in an environment is important to folks. Folks run in disconnected environments like a cruise ship or have a retail operation where they have lots of different branches. Um, and so we're committed to you know, having the same set of cloud APIs you can use you know, up in the public cloud, uh, the hyperscale environment. You yeah, get those same APIs you know, sort of in an edge form factor running inside of a branch location. Um, it's part of our strategy. Customers love it. And um, you know, uh, you know, we're actively working with folks uh, you know, doing, you know, using Kubernetes in, in those environments. Um, so to us, we do believe that uh, you know, in the longer term, the majority of computing would be happening in the public cloud data centers, just like uh, today. You know, the mo majority of the electricity is generated by those big power plants. But uh, we do recognize that uh, uh, hybrid cloud is uh, here to stay for probably quite the foreseeable future. And uh, we think it's not just uh, either and or, it's really different shades of how much you mix the on-premise cloud and the public cloud, right? It could be 0% to 100%. It's a long way. 
And also, we think that the cloud native is not a, a religion we want to force upon to the customers. We really think it's a choice, right? That your people only want to pick that choice when they help them improve the development, development efficiencies to improve saving their costs, improving their agilities, right? And in terms of the offerings, we actually offer a multitude of uh, uh, solutions to help them uh, um, through that journey. So from, say, on the public cloud, we want to embrace as much as possible the open source so that uh, you know, we run as many open source software as managed services as possible so that when uh, customers already have their applications using open source on the on-prem environment and when they move to the public cloud, they don't see much frictions. So those open source could run along some of the competing products we have developed by our own. And secondly, we also provide a, um, a, a product called the Express Connect, which essentially link your on-premise on network uh, with the VPC so that actually for those services that, that cannot be exposed to the public network, you still can run those components together as a single application. And thirdly, um, we also provide a, um, bare metal servers. I think a lot of, uh, uh, quite a few public cloud providers also do that now so that uh, it's easy for you to run your applications currently running on physical machines and running on bare metal on the cloud, right? And also we provide uh, our shrink wrap version of uh, our Apsara um, software. We call it Apsara stack. It's essentially the same code base. So um, it's only tailored for a, for a smaller uh, scale uh, 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 deployment. So I, I guess we also work with some of those enterprise solution vendors so that uh, we can integrate our storage gateways with some of those uh, storage appliances so that they can use cloud as a backup. And sometimes when disaster happens, they can use cloud as a fallback and, uh, and, and gradually they would realize more about the value of the public cloud and uh, then, then, then they would uh, uh, obviously moving to the public cloud. And John, can you finish up for us? Quickly, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, similar to everybody else, um, it, you know, Oracle has a, a cloud, a customer offering that is basically, you know, I think we're, we probably have the most on-prem software still running of this group, right? Um, <laughs> so it's so. it's very... <laughs> I don't think so. It's I don't know. <laughs> Windows, Windows, Windows Server. Well, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you want to count Office yeah. and, you know, Windows. Um, you know, so we, the, the the advantage of Kubernetes is it is that abstraction layer, right? So, you know, applications written for, you know, Oracle Kubernetes Engine also work on, on-prem Kubernetes also work on the other public clouds. That's, you know, I mentioned the multi-cloud management platform. That is one of the ways that we believe, you know, application aware, hey, I need this to run on-prem. I can scale it up as load demands, I can run it across regions, you know, again, sort of abstracting away the application knowledge from the infrastructure. Um, On-prem is just a set of characteristics. It may be caused by security or data locality or cost or, you know, because it's already a sunk cost, but it's, it's a characteristic that I use to decide where I'm running a particular application, I developed a particular workload. Um, we should support that as well as everything else. Well, and I, I do just want to mention that uh, several of you referred to it, but the certified Kubernetes program, um, which all of you uh, were launch partners on, all five of your clouds, and have also been supporting as platinum members of, uh, of CNCF, I think is really a core part of um, ensuring that cloud portability. Yeah, it's a, it's a core value for, I think, the foundation, right? That yes. we ensure portability, and, and that's, that's our mechanism to, to work that process. Certified conformant Kubernetes it allows you to run your applications anywhere. Okay, well, that's our time. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thanks, to everyone here. Yeah.